all three things must be engaged. Now, you don't have to worry about the transformation of your soul because God's love will do it for you. <laughs> do you understand? You don't have to force yourself to change because God's love will change you. You do need to allow the change to occur using your will. You do need to allow humility and truth to become a part of your being before these transformations will occur. Because love cannot enter you without these other things. So we need to go back to this basic understanding that I presented earlier, and that is God's love transforms the soul. You do not have to do it for yourself. Because God's love will do it for you. So that's number one. God's love will transform your soul. It's a guaranteed fact that God's love will transform your soul. There are billions of spirits in the celestial kingdom who know that for a fact because their own soul has been transformed by that love. Right? You do not have to worry about your soul being transformed. You do not have to try to transform your own soul. You don't have to make your own soul transformation yourself. Have I made that point clear? Okay. However, you do need to ha have an opening for the love to enter in order for the transformation to take place. Can you see the difference? There needs to be an opening inside of yourself that allows the love to transform your soul. You don't have to try to transform your soul. You just need to allow the love to do its work. Now, how do I allow the love to do its work? By being desirous of truth inside of my soul having a passionate desire in my heart to actually be in truth. And once I'm in that space, and I'm also in this other space of being completely humble to all the error that's in me, so the error can just flow out naturally. As the error is flowing out naturally, I am now, because I'm open to truth and I understand the truth will open my soul, my soul now is automatically open and there's space in it in order for the love to flow. And the love will transform me. As long as I can receive it, the love will transform me. You see, what a lot of us have been doing, even though I've presented these truths to you before, a lot of us have yet to understand them. Can you see? Like, we think we're understanding them. We think, oh, no, 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 this is what I'm trying to do. Right? But we're not understanding that you do not have to try to transform your own soul. You don't have to do that. What we need to do instead is to allow the soul to be transformed. Which is a process of being open to truth, which opens our soul, and being humble to our emotions, which allows all the negative crap, all the error, to just leave us naturally. We don't have to try to do it. It will happen naturally if we're completely open and humble. So, many of us have been doing the opposite, haven't we? Can you see that? Who, who thinks they've been doing the opposite of that? Yeah, quite a few of you. So, because what we've been doing is we're trying to receive God's love and we're trying to make our soul different so God's love will enter us. Right? God's love transforms the soul. You don't need to try to make things different. And to be honest with you, it's impossible for you to actually make things different without the reception of the transform that transforming power of God's love. So, but what you need to do is be open to its reception. There has to be an openness inside of your own soul to receiving the truth. And to allowing these negative emotions that we've picked up along our path, along our way, to leave us so there's space for love to enter us. So if you just continue, remember I've drawn this little diagram and I'll draw it up the top again. It's like a, we're like a bottle, upended if you like, but we're like a bottle. 
So just draw a bottle. There's the bottle of our soul. At the moment, for many of us, we have all this emotional experience filled to the very brim. Right? And then for many of us, we also have a very firm cap or cork on the top of that brim because we don't want to let any of it ever out. And then we're longing for divine love. <laughs> and God's trying to pour the love on this closed bottle that's already full of other things. And then we're going, I've been doing this now for two years and nothing's happened. There's been not very many substantial changes in my life. You know, I still have as much problem with my relationship as I had two years ago and I still have much problem with my friendships as I did then. I still have as much problem with money as I did then. I still have as much problem with uh, happiness as I did then. I still have as much problem creating what I want to create. I still get pretty annoyed and angry every time and frustrated all the time when I don't get what I want. All of the same things that used to happen, happened. Still happening. And then I go... There must be something wrong with this path. <laughs> there must be something wrong with what I'm hearing. It's, it sounds all right, but there must be something wrong. So we leave it for a while, and nothing else out there satisfies us, so we come back to it, and then we leave it, and we come back to it. And over a period of a few years, we might leave it and come back to it many times. Like, sometimes we feel convinced, sometimes we don't, and so forth. And, you know, the problem is... Our humility has placed this cap on top of our crap that we don't want to, because we're not humble to experiencing it, we can't release it. And if there's no space in the bottle, so there's not any space in the bottle, there must be some of this has to be cleared out in the bottle for something to be poured in. And if there's no space in the bottle, the law of physics, and there are laws of physics governing the operation of your soul, the law of physics prevents the love from entering, or anything else for that matter, for entering. And our soul doesn't have the capacity to expand either, to transform as a result. The, the love entering our soul is like transforming that bottle into an elasticised container that the more you pour in just the bigger it gets right? and that's the effect that the love has on the structure of the soul even but we don't bear we don't even worry about any of that because nothing of the love has entered us for even to have experienced that particular shift so what can we do about that well, the first thing we need to do, and I want to summarise this again for you so that it's nice and solid, at least in that regurgitating machine you've got going up there, is that God's love transforms your soul. You do not have to transform your own soul. Number one. You just need to be open to God's love entering it. Now, the two things that determine your openness to God's love entering your soul is, number one, your desire and longing for truth. There is this physical, mechanical thing that happens to your soul when you desire truth, in that your soul starts opening. Your heart starts opening to the absorption of love as a result of the, open, of the openness. The truth is the thing that opens your soul. It makes you more aware of your environment and your life and everything that's going on in it. That's the effect of the truth. It opens you to your true condition and nature. It opens you even to acknowledging the truth of the different emotions that exist within you, of the errors that were pounded into you via your environment. It opens you to that. Does that make sense? Now, it's okay if our soul's open, but it's, if it's full of crap, something has to happen. 
Now when it's open and tipped over, it will automatically flow out if we are humble. If we have this desire and passion to actually feel every single belief and emotion that exists within us, rather than just intellectualise everything. If we allow that, no matter what our environment says to do, and no matter what anybody else feels about us doing that. From that moment on, we have a chance, and in fact, if we allow that condition permanently, we will permanently continue to receive divine love, even if it's only at a dribble. <laughs> but what happens is we ebb and flow. Sometimes we get to a big truth and we go, wow, that's just pretty hard for me to accept. So I don't accept it for a while. Now, of course, my soul is now closed to receiving more of the transformational love from God. So from that moment onwards, I am not going to transform. Now, if I keep that closed for six months, then six months later, I'll look back on the last six months and I'll go, yep, I certainly have not changed on that particular issue. Right? And if I keep it closed for five years, then it will be five years. And if I keep it closed for a thousand years, it will be a thousand years. Simple as that. When I choose to have the opening to the truth, now I have the ability for the love to flow again. Right? Now I have the ability for the love to flow, but if there is error-based emotion inside of me or a belief system that is totally opposite to what that truth is saying inside of me, I'm going to have to allow myself to experience some pain in its release. I'm going to need to allow myself to feel the release of that pain rather than just go, yeah, I've got a lot of pain about how my mum treated me or my dad treated me or, or this situation or that situation here and talking about it here without feeling it here. So this is one of the problems we face. We can talk about crap until as the saying is, the cows come home until evening and we go to sleep and we wake up in the morning and we can open our mouth and talk more about the same crap. But until the, we actually open our heart in humility and open our heart to the truth, in our heart, not in our head, nothing can be transformed. Nothing. This is the reason why most Christian faiths experience a very short transformational period. Any person who enters that faith enters a very short transformational period in their soul. And then the instant a truth comes up that they do not wish to accept, they close their soul, no more transformation is going to take place. And they'll be stagnant for the rest of their life or potentially existence if they don't make a change. Billions of people in the spirit world in that condition. There are billions in the sixth dimension of the spirit world in that condition. Not wanting to accept one particular truth and so therefore completely closed to further change. Unable to progress beyond that point. They believe themselves to be happy when the comparison of happiness between the eighth and the sixth dimension is thousands of times better in the eighth than the sixth. But they won't even accept that because they do not want to be open to the truth. Yeah. Matt, if we just. I'm, I'm not sure if I'll be able to say this right, but um, how do people, like when you were saying before that, like, I don't have to change my own soul. How do people go with like the resistance to feeling like we don't like God loves us so much that she'll actually do that for us? Well, that that is an emotion yeah. or a belief, right? So, so I need to be humble to that belief and feel it. Okay. So, so for example, if I do not believe that God will make the transformation or give me any love, then I need to feel that. I need to have a good cry about the fact that I believe that God will not give me any love. 
that's a part of being humble. Once I release that pain, this yeah. belief that I have that God will not love me because of I'm no good and for some reason I'm worse than any other person on the planet and that's why God won't do it. Once I relief, release those beliefs or, or I believe there's no such thing as God, that might be a belief, so I need to release that belief. Once I release the belief emotionally, now it will automatically flow. If I have a longing for it, it will yeah. flow yeah. automatically. Exactly. Does that make sense? So, so it, you can see, can't you, that a core part of the principles of divine truth are humility and the truth <laughs> itself. The love will flow and transform automatically when we have humility and a desire for truth. This is why it's the truth that sets you free, right? Because the truth is what allows the love to enter. And if you're humble about it, it will enter. But it requires deep humility in order for that to occur. So how about we discuss... I've still got a half an hour or so before we have a break. How about we discuss each thing point by point? Does that make sense? Like, so we'll look at this passionate desire for love and the understanding that it transforms us. How about we look at that? And then how about we look at, after that, the longing for truth and the effect that truth has on our soul? And then how about we look, thirdly, at this aspect of humility again. We just revise this aspect of humility and what it means to be humble and, and what it does with error, how, how we actually process through and release this error within us. So we'll look at those particular three things, all right? So let's do that. Let's start with the first one, which is this passion or desire for God to give us love. Okay, so let's talk about God's love for a bit and its power. When you were first created as a soul, many of you understand that you were created as a whole soul to which there were basically ma masculine and feminine qualities and, and the soul split in two. And when the soul splits in two, we split into these two halves and we incarnate on this planet. Now, there can be two male halves and two female halves as well as that masculine and feminine split as I've described in other talks. Now, that soul has got a finite capacity to experience life in this moment. What, I'm, what I mean by that is, God has naturally designed this soul, which is really the complete soul that God's designed, and the process of the individualization process. God has designed all of that, but the soul itself, the individual half in this case, has a finite... Do you know what I mean by finite capacity? In other words, it's limited by its design. So, if I can give you an illustration of being limited by design. Um, many of you have a car, yes? It usually has four wheels, yes? And four tyres, yes? And it has usually a place where the occupants of the vehicle, varying in number, can sit. In relative comfort, depending on the vehicle. It gets you, it has a motor, in other words, some driving force to get you from A to B, does it not? Okay. So it has a finite capacity, the vehicle. Your seating capacity might be five, let's say, in comfort. When you add six, what do you find then? It's now uncomfortable for one or more passengers. Let's say you tried to put 25 in there. Now, I've seen that happen. Somebody tried to put 25 people in a mini minor, and I think there is a picture of it on the internet, actually. Um, now, that is an extreme degree of discomfort, is it not? But it's still possible. But you try to add 150 people to your car. Now, it's a physical 
impossibility. That's what I mean by a finite capacity. Your soul was originally designed in its natural form with a finite capacity. That finite capacity is reached when you enter the sixth dimension or the sixth sphere of the spirit world or into that same condition while you're on earth, which is possible. You experience from that moment on the finite capacity of the soul without any other external influences. Does that make sense? Now, God has also designed a system where the finite capacity of the soul can be increased. It can be bigger than its original design. It's like having a car that stretches as per the amount of people that you want to put in it. So you imagine that. You've got 25 people over for dinner and you decide you're going to go and pick them all up and all of a sudden your car's a bus. And you manage to pick them all up, drive them home. Now you don't need your car bus anymore, so it goes back to five people. And now you only need the car for one person, so it's now a one-person car. And then you want 100 people to go in the car and it expands to the 100 people and it, you can get into the, all of you can get in, in comfort in the car. So that's the kind of soul God designed for you. A soul that can expand and grow to further capacity. It no longer has a finite capacity, but the finite capacity, the, the limited capacity, can now grow. We have an option to grow the soul. To grow the soul, the soul has to transform into something else. It can't stay as it was originally designed. If it stays as it's originally designed, it has its limitations. And the limitations are the same limitations as your car, where how it was originally designed. Does that make sense? It's got a finite capacity. The method God has used to grow your soul is a, and this is, by the way, a scientific truth, not just a physical one or a spiritual one. It's a scientific truth that God's love transforms the soul into a different type of thing that can grow beyond its finite capacity. God's love does that. When God's love enters the soul, your soul can now grow beyond its original conception. God's created this ability in the soul itself for it to receive something that actually causes it to transform into an elasticized creature, something that can grow and have larger possibilities and potentials. That's what divine love does. That's the operation of divine love on your soul. Can you see that it's impossible for you to transform your soul? Because if, if you try to do it by yourself without God's love entering your soul, you can never go beyond your original finite capacity, which is the sixth dimension. You cannot grow beyond the sixth sphere. The sixth dimension in the spirit world or on earth, you can reach this state, remember. You cannot grow beyond that because that is the finite capacity that God originally designed in the soul. Just like your car, when you bought it, had a finite capacity that was originally created by its designers. Exactly the same principle. Nothing can occur, nothing can get better than that. And that's why when you buy your car, the very first day you drive that home, that's the best time you're ever going to have in your car, <laughs> probably. <laughs> because it cannot grow beyond that. It cannot change beyond that. But God designed your soul to receive something that could change it and enable it to grow beyond that. And that is God's love. That's the importance of God's love to your life. Right. So, my suggestion to you is this, with regard to understanding the transformational effect of God's love. Give up trying to transform your own soul. Many of you have yet to give this up. 
Many of you think if you try harder, you do more effort here, do more effort there. If you try harder here, try harder there, you try to be good, <laughs> something's going to change. It's not going to change beyond its original finite capacity. It might change from beyond where you are, but it won't change beyond the original finite capacity, that six-sphere capacity. It can't change. It cannot change, in fact, without the reception of God's love. It cannot change. Right. So give it up. Give up the personal desire to be personally responsible for the transformation of your own soul because you can't do it. You will not ever enter the seventh dimension of the spirit world, either on earth or in heaven. You will not enter that state until you give up the thought that you can transform your own soul. Because you can't. You can't do it. So what would a person who really understands the divine love path do? If you really got it in your heart. Um, I'd be praying for a greater desire for God's love to enter and transform. Awesome, yes. Mm. We can actually improve our desire for it, can't we? That is something we can change because that's something under our control. That's out under our control. That and that are under our control. We can be passionate, longing, desirous. That's all under our control. We can long for the thing, the substance that transforms us. We, that is under our control. Right up the back. I think it's, uh, D. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. AJ, when we pray for a stronger desire, yep. does that desire, when our desire gets stronger, is that an intellectual desire or is it? Well, can, well firstly, can God give you more desire? I want to say no, it's mine. Well, I'd agree with you. God can't give you more desire. When your soul transforms into a new, bigger thing, it might have more desire then, but God's not actually giving you more desire right at that moment before it happens. Does that make sense? So, so when you pray for an improved desire, how effective is this prayer? Have you found it effective in the past? How many of you have found the prayer for more desire effective? Yeah? Why would it be effective for you? Ange, thanks. If you have the mic. Uh, because we open ourselves up to more truth. Ah. Yeah, see what we're doing is we're saying to ourselves, I realise that I need to have a stronger desire inside of myself. And this is a basic truth. It's called the truth of the law of desire. The truth of the law of desire is if I have a stronger desire, I'll have a stronger effect. And that is a basic truth of that law. So I realise that if I just sit on my... Uh, what, what's the saying? Okay. Sorry? Laurels, is it? Oh, I have a more crass way probably of saying it than, than most of you. <laughs> If I just sit on my backside, expecting things to come to me without exercising a desire, will things ever come to me? Will you try it? Like my suggestion, if you believe that is occurring, see the problem is that many of us do believe that should occur with love and spiritual truth. But the reality is for all of us, we all understand that it doesn't occur with physical things. So you, you try it with physical things, what happens? You sit on your backside, whole of next week. You don't go anywhere. You just couch potato. And see whether somebody feeds you. Now, unfortunately, for some of you, somebody might feed you. And that's a bit of a shame for both you and the person who's doing that. But for the majority of you, you will find that you will not get fed. And particularly if you're by yourself, you will definitely not get fed. You will sit there and after two days, you'll probably start feeling really hungry. For most of us, it might be after four or five hours, right? And you'd start feeling really thirsty. And actually after five days, you could be in very serious trouble if you didn't have a drink or two at least in that time. You could be in very serious trouble. Only five days. 
five days not having a desire to feed yourself and you can almost be dead if you also don't drink, right? And if you keep on going without any water, within a few weeks, it's highly unlikely that the parts of your whole body will start closing down and causing major drama to your entire body, yes? So all of you have learned through your personal experience that if you're hungry, you better do something about it. And if you're thirsty, you've got to do something about it. Is that not true? You're driven by a desire to feed yourself, yes? Okay. And yet, we have this belief with God's love that we should be able to just sit on our backside and do nothing and it should all just come to me. That's what we believe. We believe what is not in actual fact happening in any physical sense in the universe and yet we believe it should happen in a spiritual condition. How logical is that? If it's not happening in your day-to-day -day life with other things, it's highly unlikely that sitting on your backside without doing anything is going to have an effect with your relationship with God either. Can you see that? And that's partly the law of desire. There's a law that governs that. If you desire something passionately, it will come to you. Is how. But to desire something passionately, do you sit on your backside? Definitely not. You take affirmative action to getting it, do you not? And you don't wait until everybody else gives it to you. You take action for yourself, do you not? And that's something we need to do with God's love. Same principle. Eagle?